Hello everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan here with Raptor Chatter to talk about all of the new paleontological finds and discoveries from August 2019. Many fossils don't have the opportunity to be studied in great detail, and some of these fossils have been later proven to be entirely new species. One such fossil was discussed this month, being proven to be a new species in Guevu and Loco, having previously been assigned to Massospondylus. Nguevu represents a new genus of early prosauropod coming from the Elliott Formation of South Africa. This formation has a lot of different types of early prosauropods, and not just Massospondylus and Nguevu, but also animals like Ledu Mahadi and Ardenex. With this much diversity coming out of just this one location, it helps to highlight just how successful the prosauropods were before they further evolved into the sauropods. The dromaeosaurs, like Deinonychus and Velociraptor, are famous for their foot claws, and while movies like Jurassic Park have proposed the idea of them using this foot claw for slashing, that doesn't seem to be the case based on a new study. The researcher found that based on the amount of force that could be imparted on the claws, it was much more likely that these claws were used as grappling hooks to help control and position prey so that the mouths could deliver the killing bite rather than the claws being used for killing, as has been previously suggested. And this approach isn't uncommon. Even in the modern day, with animals like the big cats, they use their claws to control and position prey so that they can do the same thing in delivering a killing bite with their mouths. And so while the idea proposed by Alan Grant in Jurassic Park isn't likely, the dromaeosaurs were still very successful in their own right. Some pterosaurs like Tenochasma and Pterodastro have suggested the idea that some pterosaurs filter fed. Because of the long, bristle-like teeth in their mouths, it's been suggested that these were used to help capture small krill and other small crustaceans from the water. Coprolites coming from Poland and in very close proximity to pterosaur trackways have been attributed to relatives of these species, and they show this kind of filter feeding behavior with very small forums, a type of plankton, being found within the coprolites, and some of them being very small, just 0.3 millimeters across. This helps to reaffirm that some of the pterosaurs were filter feeding, and while the life was different during the Mesozoic, it wasn't so strange when compared to animals that filter feed today, such as flamingos. The early stegosaurs are very poorly known, but coming from the middle Jurassic of Morocco, Adratiklit Bolafa has helped to illuminate the group's history. Audra Tiglet has been shown to be more closely related to the European stegosaurs than to stegosaurs found in southern Africa, such as Kentrosaurus. This helps to show that the stegosaurs were already well into diversifying by the time the continents became well separated during the Jurassic period. The Cambrian explosion has left many questions for researchers. One of these is how did life become so complex during a time period where there was such little oxygen in the oceans? A new study seems to have a solution. By closely looking at a single section of layered rocks, scientists have found that while most of the time the waters were anoxic, having low oxygen, there were periods where fossils would show up which indicate that there was high oxygen. And this means that occasionally there would be high oxygen environments within that overall low oxygen environment. And life would be able to move into these small patches of well oxygenated water before migrating away as that oxygen rich area would move depending on sea level, climate, and ocean currents. These periodic oxygenation events would have provided the pockets needed for life to truly take root during the Cambrian and would eventually lead to the diversity of life that we have today. So now we have two papers about somewhat similar subject matter, giant birds. The first is about a giant penguin coming from New Zealand. The new penguin species, Crossvalia wyaparensis, comes from the Paleocene deposits just after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs during the end Cretaceous extinction 66 million years ago. With a variety of early penguins being found from just after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, Crossvalia wyaparensis helps us to understand that one of two things happened. Either A, these penguins had already diversified before that extinction event and survived through it to become as diverse as they were, or they diversified very, very rapidly after the extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs. 
While we can't say for sure which one of these two it was, it helps us to understand that after extinction events, diversity happens very quickly, either from diversity that's already survived and existed and then rediversifies even further, or from single species that are able to then diversify and fill a wide variety of niches, even if those niches may be similarly related. The next is a paper on a giant parrot, also coming from New Zealand. Heracles inexpectatus was over a meter tall and represents one of the closest relatives to the modern day parrots, the Kia and the Kakapo. Animals like Heracles help to show that the diversity of New Zealand parrots goes back further than previously thought, and it's very likely accurate to say that this small group of very unique parrots in New Zealand likely had already separated out and evolved divergently from the rest of the parrots that are found across the world by the time New Zealand split away from Australia around 80 million years ago. Because of their isolation on New Zealand, there's also the chance that these parrots might be the basal most parrots in the world, being closest to whatever the original ancestor of all parrots is. Often, the Rancho La Brea tar pits have been used as evidence that saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, and other carnivores were all fighting over the same food sources. But new isotope analysis shows that that's probably not the case, which makes a lot of sense. Dire wolves and saber-toothed cats fighting over the same food sources would be a very competitive environment, and so this isotope analysis helps to indicate that the saber-toothed cats were more likely hunting in forests, much like modern day big cats, whereas the dire wolves would have been more out on the open plains, hunting for things like bison, much like modern day gray wolves can do today. This also means that the idea of a saber-toothed cat going after a mammoth is pretty unrealistic. It's far more likely they were hunting animals like deer and tapir in the forests, rather than going out onto the plains where the mammoths lived and were able to hunt those. This kind of behavior can be called niche partitioning and helps different species that may superficially have similar behaviors survive in the same environment. By breaking up the different resources, such as food, into different environments, they're able to more specifically specialize on just what they need to survive rather than coming into direct competition with other carnivores. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. We're still working on getting moved but we should have a baby by the next video, so that's exciting. Started classes officially, so going through those, I'm excited to finally have like upper level geology classes. Be safe, take care, don't go extinct.